Hi, I'm Caroline. And I'm Lennis. We're two engineers who saw a problem. And like any good engineer, we decided to solve it. You see, two out of every five women who earn an engineering degree will leave their field by the 12 year mark of their career. That's a definite problem. We witnessed, and us ourselves were, incredibly talented women who were burning out, which is what brings us here today. We're two women with a mutual passion to help you prevent burnout. In this sophomore season, we're bringing in experts in our fields, difference makers in STEM, to help you truly transform the way you work. So we invite you to take a quick break with us and choose one small step today to prioritize your well-being through this episode. So take a deep breath and let's do it. Hello and welcome to this week's episode of Take a Break, where we are joined by Rebecca Kathleen Anderson. Rebecca is obsessed with improving access, agency, and belonging in tech careers. She leads career development for graduate students at UC Berkeley, facilitates leadership development programs for gender equity, and conducts academic research on STEM careers, currently focusing her dissertation in this area. She's an educator at heart and believes in the promise of education to transform, to open minds and open doors. Her focus is not on getting underrepresented or undeserved individuals into the tech pipeline. Her focus is on how we can transform tech into a place that doesn't push these individuals out. We're so excited to have you, Rebecca. Thank you for joining us today. Yeah, I'm so excited to be here. Thank you for having me. This is going to be a lot of fun. Yeah, I I love, 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 um, especially that last part of your bio. But before we really jump into the conversation, uh, we'd like to kick off the uh, this talk with asking you, what do you feel has been the hardest part of being a woman in STEM? That's a great question. I mean, I think it remains, for me, the hardest part is it's all the unseen, unseen, unsaid curriculum. Mm. There's so much, you know, I was just telling my manager the other day, I feel like I missed the class on politics and on how I'm supposed to present and act in this meeting. And I'm 42. Yeah. <laughs> like I've been in the workforce for a long time. And yet there's a way of responding. There's a way of communicating often with those who just automatically belong in tech or have had models. I come from a really small rural area. I didn't have mm. models in this space. Mm -hmm. um, so to figuring out how to show up as myself authentically, but also as one who could be accepted, just, you know, I think it's the continual challenge that I have. Um, mm -hmm. And I think a lot of women have, and a lot of folks have when they don't um, have that network already have that sponsorship in the tech space. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I hear so many conversations around this very thing of, you know, the the double standard maybe and how women mm -hmm. receive feedback for the way that they present in the workplace that they're, um, they're too crass, they're too short, they're intimidating um, because they're, they've recognized, oh, well, when my male peer um, acts or behaves this way, then his ideas are accepted or, or things mm -hmm. progress. Uh, so I'm going to adopt a little bit of that behavior and then it comes back to bite me. And uh, it, it is a very like complicated, I love that you called it curriculum because you do kind of feel like you're, you're learning as you go and you feel like there's a test that you're kind of set up for failure with uh, in some way, shape or form. Yeah, I mean, especially I think is in STEM as women, you know, we go through these undergraduate experiences, um, surviving <laughs> those classes, <laughs> making it through, figuring out um, how to find our networks, get the grades. I did that. I went through graduate school um, in engineering. I got my first job in engineering in the Silicon Valley in semiconductor. 
Mm-hmm. And I thought, this is it. I made it. I'm done. And then when you get there, you figure out, well, this is a whole nother world that I've never seen before. And that is just completely foreign that I'm stepping into, but everyone else is really comfortable in. Um, and that's why I do, I like calling it a curriculum because I feel like it's something we should teach. We should call out. It shouldn't be something that we assume that people understand and, and know. There's all these things that people, somebody knows, and then we don't. And like you say, we get judged on these double standards. Um, I remember early in my career being told that I was too aggressive Mm -hmm. to, you know, all the things, (laughs) Um, too aggressive, talked too much, too enthusiastic, just too much. Mm-hmm. And I overcorrected quite a bit. And I'm still recovering from that um, overcorrection and that idea that I have to diminish myself in order to make others comfortable. And there, there is a piece of that, you know, making space. Um, but I just went way too far and started hiding so much of myself and becoming so you know, just uh, I lost all of my confidence and all of my joy and kind of the work for a while. And coming back from that and feeling like it is okay to be present is really hard, I think. Yeah. 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 And that purpose is what drives us, right? Like connecting mm-hmm. to the impact that you have. And, and when that gets diminished, it can really, really wreak havoc on all kind of all facets of our, our work and our identity and work. Yeah, I, I love that you mentioned uh, politics, right? That we have to navigate because it does feel like this ground uh, that we're just not used to. And especially in coming out of school, you're thrown into uh, the arena, right? And all of a sudden mm-hmm. you're like, wait a minute, what, what's going on here? This, is, this, this game is being played by completely different rules. And um, I... I spoken with many women and I myself I remember having a conversation with with a friend from college and I was like I honestly just cannot stand the office politics and she's like oh I thrive with them so I was like it just showed the completely different personalities that we had and I was like yeah you should have been a lawyer or something (laughs) else but yeah for I, I feel most women that I've spoken with do resonate with not feeling at all comfortable with with navigating those uh, landscapes of uh, politics in the office or in academia or wherever it is. Yeah, wherever you are, they're present. Um, in my in the leadership development programs I work with, a very common thread is women not knowing how to advocate for themselves successfully. Mm. Um, it comes up whether they're new in their career or they've been in their career for twenty plus years. Um, because we're judged differently on on how we advocate. I remember someone in my research sharing that in an interview, she was told that she shouldn't spend so much time describing her background and her accomplishments in that question, tell me about yourself. And she's thinking Uh to herself like, okay, so you don't want me to talk about these things, but I'm a woman, so you're going to assume I don't have them and you're going to judge me on them. Mm -hmm. What am I supposed to do here? Right. You know? And wouldn't yeah. it be great if we could be judged on our work, but but we're not. <laughs> and so, you know, I don't know the answer to this. I think no one really does. Mm-hmm. But one thing that I was telling my undergraduate class yesterday, if I could go do things over, if I was starting out fresh, I think one of the most important things is to go and find that sponsor, mm. go and find that person, because as women, we can't be the only one talking about how awesome we are because we will be judged for that. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Fortunately. Yeah. Yeah. Um, We do need to do that, but we're, we need someone else to be doing that too. And we need Mm -hmm. somebody in the room. (laughs) Mm -hmm. (laughs) We're talking about that when we're not in the room and it doesn't happen automatically. Um, You know, and I think a lot of, I'm just going on a total tangent right now, but (laughs) I think a lot of allies, you know, if you think about the allyship, like this is the work, Um, you know, if somebody comes to you and says, can I get a referral instead Mm -hmm. of saying yes or saying, no, I don't think this is right. Give them reasons, give them feedback, give them Mm -hmm. more, be in that room talking about them, learn about that person, Mm -hmm. Um, take the time. 
to learn about your colleagues who maybe don't have that representation so that later on you can bring them up and bring them forth. It takes extra time and effort, but we need that to happen. You know, women are so obsessed with lifting other women up, but we need everybody to do it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So I think this is um, exactly where we want to kind of dig in with the work mm -hmm. that you do. You know, you, you said that you don't focus on getting people into the pipeline. You're focused on keeping them in the pipeline. And for me, that was also why I went into this work was we were talking about how few girls were we're getting into engineering, but we weren't talking about how few women are staying in engineering, right? Mm -hmm. And it's like an atrocious retention rate that we see even still to this day. And it's kind of gotten worse with co the COVID pandemic and women really having to reach their breaking point with their careers. So when you're focusing on your work, what are some of the foundational things that you've seen really helped to get the transformation uh, to happen? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I mean, a lot of it is doing the work. So we focus on getting women to graduate with STEM degrees. Companies are focused on those. Inter There's a lot of programs now, you know, for internship hiring, and it's still very, very hard, but there's ways in there, these pipelines. But then we're developing these pipelines we're not developing the pathways. Mm. So I think that's a key piece there is, you know, okay, we've gotten you in, but then you're completely on your own. Yeah. And what really does help is developing the pathway and developing these markers. Um, and they can, they can vary in structure, but really starting with just anything so that women have a pathway to follow. I think structured, mentorship opportunities um getting a mentor we all talk about it i think everyone kind of knows like oh mentorship's really important but how do you get a mentor how do you ask somebody to be a sponsor for you that's tough um so putting structures in place to help facilitate that whether it's in the company or with some of these great orgs outside like latinas in tech is doing great work in that space so that we can start to have that representation. Um, we can't solve things like chilly environments um, all on our own. Like um, chilly environments, I mean, you know, if you go into a space and it doesn't, you don't feel wanted, you don't feel belonging, maybe they're talking about things that um, don't relate at all. Um, a lot of stereotypes being brought up. We can't solve that, but we can create um, spaces where women can share you know, how to counteract that, where we can share what we do, where we can feel like we're not alone. And mm -hmm. you're creating that social capital to then help continue building that pathway. Because it really is when you go into promo period, um, promotions are usually decided by committee. So mm -hmm. we need that committee to know who we are, <laughs> to know why these things are important. And then, you know, another thing that I'm not seeing, but women are talking about a lot is, is this kind of work. So you are doing this podcast, for example, this is amazing. Mm -hmm. um, and women are working in like employee resource groups and doing amazing work there to help support women. Is that included in the promo cycle? Mm. Is that valued when it comes time to go from eng one to eng two? Is it considered mm. a part? of a role. And, you know, I think managers will often say like, oh yes, we definitely support this. We support you doing this. We support you going to Grace Hopper. But does that support extend to performance? Are we mm -hmm. recognizing that? Because at the end of the day, if, if companies really want women, if we really want underrepresented identities, we should recognize people who are doing the work. I mm -hmm. think it's baloney that we have. We're basically relying on volunteers and capitalizing on all this free labor <laughs> that is happening without recognizing it. And it really happens to some degree to the detriment of our careers. Yeah. Um, even myself, a lot of the work I do, it's not included in my, um, the responsibilities in my job description. It's not included in my promo. People say it's great. You know, I might get a shout out here and there, but I'm also told like, this shouldn't take away from your day job. <laughs> we heard that, right? Yeah. 
Yeah, what yeah. a great call to action for organizations is to really evaluate that and 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 look at hey when we're we're talking about promotions, we're talking about leadership, we're talking about the the skill set of our employee population, are we considering mm-hmm. those who are taking on these type of leadership roles because they are forms of leadership. They are a demonstration mm-hmm. of important skills that help really support the business performance. Right. And it's Mm -hmm. totally undervalued. I, what a great call to action. Yeah. I'm I'm so happy that you are mentioning this because it is frustrating and, and it's part of the issue with that pathway and that retention um, of women and, and underrepresented minorities is, is that we tend to be very giving. And -hmm. then it's like, Oh, that actually hurt my performance. It's like, wait, why? (laughs) It doesn't make any sense. You know, and in my research, one of the topics is around career choice and what drives women in their careers in tech. And overwhelmingly, a, a piece of that, women will mention they're being driven by helping other women, mm-hmm. by wanting to be in a place where they can change the way interviews are done, where they can change um, promotions, where they can change the network women have, all these things. I, I haven't done this yet, but in the next phase of research, I'm very curious if we asked men, what drives your career? Would they say lifting up other men, lifting up women? <laughs> like I'm pretty sure for, and I, I mean, I'm not trying to disparage, but I think right. what a privilege and how awesome is it to have your career just be driven by yourself? Wouldn't mm-hmm. that be like kind of freeing? <laughs> but yeah. we have all these other people we're trying to lift up too. And, you know, like McKinsey's um, Women in the Workplace report always highlights increasingly in the last couple of years how female managers really help lift up others and what a difference female managers make in the workplace to productivity, to collaboration, to innovation. We should be recognizing that. I really think a big piece of this that we're not doing right now in tech, and it's the tech, it's the companies, it's the structures is we can't keep relying on this meritocracy and just getting people in and then evaluating them the same way. We do have different strengths. We do bring different Mm -hmm. backgrounds and perspectives. We should be valuing that. You cannot expect my first gen, you know, coming from a completely different career field graduate student to show up in the same way in an interview as somebody who's had an undergrad in software engineering, had six internships, you know, and all these things, they're not going to show up the same. Why are we evaluating them the same way? And it's the same for women who have been in tech for a long time and maybe had families or taken a break. They're not the same. And that's Mm -hmm. actually a good thing. (laughs) And we should be recognizing that and appreciating that, but it takes doing the work, I think. Yeah. I, I think this is just, um, <laughs> I, I love that we're getting into the passionate part because yes. <laughs> when I was reading uh, about your work, Rebecca, one thing that came to mind, like that really stood out for me was you, you said that you love messy problems spaces, mm-hmm. which honestly, when I read it, I laughed and then I cringed. I'm like, oh, I tensed up. <laughs> <laughs> so what do you think? is your driving force behind loving this messy spaces? Where do you think that comes from? Oh, that's a great question. Um, I think I've always been a person who's, I just can't help but improve things. Mm. I, I really love looking at something and it's good. It's a good and bad thing because I've had to learn like people develop things. People are passionate about the things they develop. So you can't come in and just be like, I want to change this all. <laughs> But I I just, I love being able to make a difference um, and to kind of dive into it. And it can seem intimidating. And I remind myself of this a lot. You know, when I step in um, to a new role or a new project, it's very intimidating to do that. When I, when I, well, I mean, this dissertation is super intimidating um, Mm -hmm. as an example. But then I remind myself, would you, would you want to give this up? Would you want someone else to do this work? Mm. Uh, Or would, if you gave it to somebody else, would you think, oh, uh, but I could, I have an idea on that. And and I always do have an idea on that. So yeah, it's just something I like diving into. 
I also love messy problem spaces because I take a design thinking philosophy. Mm -hmm. And with design thinking, I find design thinking very freeing because design thinking says messy problem spaces like how to get equity in tech careers, for example, there's no one right answer. Mm -hmm. And so that, what that means is any answer I do <laughs> is going to be progress. And yes. it just releases me from having to get it right. Um, yeah. And that's really, really great and interesting, I think. What a, like a powerful antidote to imposter syndrome, right? To just ask yourself that question of, would I be willing to give this up? The ideas that I have, the the impact that I know that I have, mm -hmm. even if I feel like I'm underqualified or if I, I've somehow lucked my way into being in this space, would I be willing to to relinquish the opportunity to make a positive difference here? And that to me is so inspiring and encouraging when mm -hmm. imposter syndrome feels like this really intimidating big thing to try to conquer, right? Like a D David and Goliath type of, uh, type of battle. So that, that little piece right there can be the stone. Yeah. I think that's really helpful. Um, imposter syndrome is always present for me. <laughs> it's just something I'm able to kind of like put over there. Because, because I can ask those kinds of questions. And then the other thing is that I'm a firm believer in surrounding yourself in a culture and an environment or with people that you really trust and, mm -hmm. and have them be your folks who can counter that imposter. Um, there was a, the Dean of, I think it was the Dean of um, School of Social Welfare at Berkeley. I'm forgetting her name. And she recently, she was on this panel that I heard and she said, be careful with who you allow to validate you. And that was mm. a powerful statement to me because mm -hmm. in my career and in my life, I've allowed anybody to validate me. <laughs> mm -hmm. You know, random person yeah. that says a mean thing that has hit me hard. And then I realized, no, I can be choosy. You know, if I respect mm -hmm. you, if you're somebody that I look up to, if you are in a position where I, I think you should have an opinion, I'm going to allow you into this validation club and you can be my validation crew and you can validate me. But, you know, random person that I don't, I don't um, respect, or you don't know me or you don't know this context. No, you're going on the yeah. side. You don't validate me. You don't get to have an opinion on this. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's, that's awesome. I love that. Rebecca, it's time to shift to ask our burning question of the week. You have given us so many great strategies for the organizational level uh, and, and even at the individual level. So I want to mm -hmm. now focus on the leader. Mm. What is the first step that you think leaders need to take in order to create true gender equity and representation within their organizations? That's a great question. And of course, a hard one to answer. I think there's not one right answer, um, but I'm going to say two things and they're simple. Um, the first one is do the work. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's so simple, but I heard somebody say this recently and it, it really is, it's extra work and you have to do the work. Um, and part of doing the work is listening and asking mm -hmm. questions. So I think really a first step is to ask, ask um, your people what you can do, ask them what they're interested in. Um, and don't expect great responses. You know, I know a male colleague who recently asked a, you know, a female subordinate about like what they could do. And the woman didn't really have anything. And they were like, okay, well, they don't have anything. It's good. And that's not the case. I mean, there's a lot of power, understand, like people are put on the spot. So ask around, ask widely, do the work, become educated, try things. You're gonna get it wrong. I get it wrong. Um, and then when you get it wrong, don't make it about the other person. Apologize. Mm -hmm. Doing the work. Um, it really does just take trying things, listening, being present. Uh, sponsorship doesn't happen by accident. It doesn't happen, mm -hmm. you know, organically. Um, being an ally does not happen organically. We need to actually do the work. <laughs> just like full stop. <laughs> Yeah, I, I love it's almost like give yourself permission to fail and then get out the stuff and keep on going as a leader. I think 
um, we may feel extra pressure of, mm -hmm. of having to show up in a certain way. So having, having that, uh, those, those first two steps, I think it's, it's just an incredible path that they can follow as well. So thank you for sharing that. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> yeah, so we're going to move into our habit or try this at home of this yeah. week. So each week, each one of us shares what we're trying to prioritize currently for our energy, to manage stress, or just to care for our feminine selves. So uh, this season, we wanted to include our guest experts in the fun. <laughs> and we would like to ask you, Rebecca, what is one small step you take to prioritize yourself? Yeah, the small stuff I'm doing recently is trying to get my steps. <laughs> I'm trying to move because <laughs> I find that I don't move quite as much. And, you know, even it's raining outside today. So I've spent time just walking around my house. <laughs> But it really helps to get moving. Um, and it's something I'm doing for myself. Mm -hmm. That's such a great reminder, especially as we are in kind of like the colder uh, months, maybe some shorter days and that pull to, to go out for our normal walk might not be as strong, but still just equally as important. My call uh, to action today, I keep saying call to action, my, <laughs> my habit for today um, is a stress management technique called a butterfly hug. <clears throat> So butterfly hug, you cross your hands uh, on your chest and I kind of do it my own way where I count um, between my taps, you alternate tapping from your right side to your left side. And I increase the length of time as I'm counting in between each tap. So I start uh, on my right side, I count to one, I tap on my left side, then I count to two and tap on my right side and then I count to three. And I do that all the way until I have counted to 10. Mm. This is a great way of just kind of calming down the nervous system, getting into the body, focusing on one thing, which helps us relieve that stress response. So uh, a, a butterfly hug could be a great way for interrupting your stress this winter season. Oh, I'm definitely going to try that for sure. <laughs> But um, this week, what I wanted to encourage everyone is as we are in the thick of winter, it was in the 30s this morning, just getting cold exposure is actually good for your body. It's good for your immune system. It's good for your stress response because cold does create stress but it's a, a short period of time. And when you breathe through it and you're doing it on purpose, it really gonna help. It's really gonna help uh, navigate through this cold months and cold weather um, that we're exposed to. So if you can, if you are somewhere that is warm or it doesn't really get into the freezing temperatures, try it in the shower. Just those last 10, 15 seconds, go into the cold water and just stand there and you can do it. Uh, but it really feels, for me, it really feels so refreshing. It just like, it sparks my energy. So I will definitely recommend anyone who's brave enough to uh, get some cold exposures to do this and try it at home. Well, there you have it, folks. Which habit will you choose to prioritize this week? Are you going to do a polar plunge? I might have to follow <laughs> Lennis's lead on that one. Share us by commenting on this video or tagging us on social media as you're doing your habits this week. Rebecca, thank you so much for joining us. It was a pleasure to be in this conversation with you and to learn from you. So as we conclude, please let the audience know how they can connect with you. Yeah, thank you so much. I've really enjoyed the conversation as well. It's been such a privilege to be here. Um, folks can connect with me on LinkedIn is the easiest. As a career coach, I kind of live on LinkedIn <laughs> and I'm easy to find. It's Rebecca K. Anderson with an S-E-N. Um, so if you look me up, I'm the only one at UC Berkeley. Wow, what an incredible conversation. We hope you found this to be inspiring and encouraging in your own journey. If you're feeling called to continue the conversation, reach out to us. My specialty is in helping individuals and organizations create truly effective plans for burnout prevention, 
and manage the change to get them from point B, burnout, to point P, performance. You can learn more and find me at MiltonCC.com. My specialty is in wellness engineering. And you may ask, what the heck is a wellness engineer? Well, I hope you stop trying to fit in and connect with your most authentic self so you can have more impact, fulfillment, and enjoy each day of your life. You can learn more and find me at lettuceforest.com. Don't forget to hit the subscribe button to catch each new episode. And while you're here, why not check out some of our past episodes as well? Until next time, be well and don't forget to take a break.